You're listening to the Chorus One podcast, a show that covers decentralized networks and their impact on the evolution of automated and borderless economies. On this podcast, we invite pioneers and builders to discuss the decentralized protocols and projects they are working on. On the show today, we have Sergey Gorbanov, co-founder of Axelar. Axelar Network is a decentralized state machine responsible for facilitating cross-chain requests. Axelar's gateway protocol is a delivery and routing protocol that can work with any arbitrary blockchain regardless of consensus. This means any decentralized network can plug into Axelar seamlessly to access liquidity amongst other things from all other decentralized networks. Axelar also gives developers the freedom to connect their dApp into external networks that might have been previously inaccessible to them without redesigning their smart contracts. The show with Sergey covers his previous experience, how Axelar is different from Cosmos and Polkadot, what validators do in their network, their solution for scaling threshold cryptography, and their vision for an interoperability network that is consensus and state transition agnostic. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Chorus One podcast. Today with the hosts, uh, Xavier and me, Felix. And uh, we have a special guest today, Sergey Gorbanov from uh, Axelar. Hi, Sergey, and, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, guys. Great to be here. So, Sergey, thanks for coming on the show today. It's the first show that Felix and I have been in separate locations doing the podcast. Nice. So there's a first time for everything. Um, and so basically, we have you on the show today. Uh, to talk about your network, which is Axelar Network. So I, all our listeners, I'm sure, are dying to hear what exactly is Axelar Network. Yeah, so Axelar Network is a decentralized network and uh, infrastructure that connects uh, users and uh, applications across autonomous uh, blockchain ecosystems. And so the main goal of the Axelar Network is to enable uh, composability, shared liquidity, and uh, information transfer across uh, different blockchains. All right, that's a very great, like short uh, overview. But definitely, uh, is a lot to unpack there. Uh, I think what maybe is also interesting for the listeners: how did you end up in this? Um, generally, I guess maybe the crypto space, and also specifically this realm of let's say interoperability between blockchain networks. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so my, you know, a little bit of uh, kind of a, my background and uh, originally started to work in the tech space in various like distributed systems, software defined networking, and a lot of like networking uh, infrastructure in the early days. And then I studied formal uh, sort of cryptography for a while um, at MIT, designing various cryptographic protocol schemes, like working on various uh, standards. And uh, kind of by the end of it, I started to work in the blockchain space. So it was 2014, 2015 worked on some of the early designs behind the Algorand uh, protocol that uh, we worked with um, Silvio and a bunch of other folks uh, from the MIT. And um, after launching the Algorand protocol, uh, to me, it became very evident that we're entering sort of multi-chain um, world, right? There's now more and more different blockchain ecosystems that have been developed, many of them optimized for specific uh, technical characteristics, target specific markets, or um, you know, address specific user needs. And so as a result of it, we wanted to be able to kind of compose and interact, uh, you know, the Algram protocol that we built with other ecosystems. And ideally, you know, we just wanted to call somebody and say, okay, could you plug in, you know, this protocol that we built with a bunch of other uh, protocols that are out there already running with applications. And unfortunately, it wasn't that easy. You know, there's uh, no single uh, kind of protocol that would really address our needs. And uh, so that's when um, my uh, co-founder, Jorgos, and I uh, started the Axel Network uh, kind of from the ground up and uh, started to rethink about the problem is that how can we kind of connect all these different blockchain ecosystems that speak different consensus rules, have very different software stacks. And so how could we make it easier for you know, the information and for access to flow across them? And so that's what led us to think a lot about interoperability and uh, and kind of we took it, uh, you know, from the bottom up approach and started to rethink about what would the solution that would, you know, help the ecosystem move forward look like. And that's that's how we, uh, you know, came about to think about the Excel network and designing it. And so you mentioned interoperability and you know, on the Axelar white paper, 
you mentioned two protocols that you use to, to you know have this interoperability with Axelar. And so the first one is cross-chain gateway protocol and the other is cross-chain transfer protocol. Could you please just describe uh, what these sort of mechanisms are and how they attribute in your network? Yeah, so I think uh, one thing that we'd like to differentiate from you know the beginning is uh, routing and delivery protocols from application level protocols, right? So I think a lot of the time when we talk about ecosystem, um, you know, and interoperability, we don't really differentiate those things today, right? So there's like bridging technologies, there's like you know uh, things like um, you know IBC, but there's still so all of those things I would think of kind of delivery and routing protocols, right, at the, at the very core of it. And so the, the gateway protocol that we're designing is another, you can think of a delivery or routing protocol, right? It has been designed to work with um, arbitrary blockchains. So regardless of the consensus rule, regardless of the kind of underlying uh, support from the, uh, from the smart contract platforms and so on and so forth. And so it's a delivery and routing protocol. The... Um, Cross-chain uh, transfer protocol is an application-level protocol that will be building on top of it, such such that uh, developers can, uh, you know, build on their application on any platform of their needs, and then leverage this cross-chain transfer protocol as an application-level protocol to compose with other ecosystems, right? And so, the gateway protocol effectively, you know, parses requests coming in from the uh, cross-chain transfer protocol. It understands what those are, and it routes them to the right destination platform. It's responsible for uh, watching how they're finalized and delivers them. And uh, the transfer protocol is kind of an abstraction above that will expose to the developers to actually make it easier to leverage all this cross-chain infrastructure that we're building. Okay, so um, it's also called yeah cross-chain transfer. Is it specifically like focused on transfers or can you also basically uh, carry out arbitrary like interactions i guess i mean maybe the goal would be initially of course moving tokens across chain is great but maybe you want to like uh, interact with smart co contracts across chains is that the goal for this too or is that another protocol that needs to be still built yeah i mean it's certainly a goal is uh, you know of the of these protocols right so the protocol itself initially we are focusing on uh, kind of asset transfer application and use cases because that's where we see you know, 95% of the demand in the ecosystem today, but the protocol is, you know, generic enough that you can pass as, you know, a message to be executed, you know, on a, on a destination platform and then uh, get, get a result back to, to your, um, to your application. So yeah, it, it's not specific to, to asset transfers. It's a kind of general information transfer carry protocol that we'll be able to invoke. And I want to take it back maybe a little bit, um, really interested so when you started building Axela, did interoperability protocols such as Cosmos and Polkadot, uh, did they already exist at that time? Um, did you see some flaws maybe with them that you thought that you could solve yourself with Axela? Yeah, so, um, you know, Cosmos, of course, is, you know, has been around uh, for a while and the protocol was in development. Uh, same with the uh, Polkadot protocol that um, and we started, it was still in development. I'm not even sure what state they're on right now. I don't think they, they shipped the... Uh, their protocol yet, but Cosmos, you know, recently launched uh, IBC. So yeah, well, of course, you know, we're very familiar with those uh, protocols and some of the development. Um, and but for us, the goal was a little bit different, right? So I think you know, if you look at those protocols uh, from the beginning, I think the way they were designed is that they address interoperability very well within those ecosystems, right? So within the Cosmos, if you have an attendment based uh, sort of chain you're able to interact through IBC with other attendant based chains, right? Through the Cosmos SDK and, and the protocol wor works uh, great for that, right? And same thing, I think the Polkadot ecosystem, they focused on their protocol to allow, you know, various parachains to transfer information and assets across them. And, uh, you know, it, it serves uh, the needs of those ecosystems. And I think for us, the goal was to really kind of, how do we connect ecosystems that uh, don't necessarily uh, speak uh, each other's consensus rules that, um, you know, don't understand each other's like state transition functions, don't have efficient, uh, you know, light clients and all, and all those other prerequisites that, you know, you would need for one of those other protocols. And so we started with the simple goal that we want our protocol to be almost like a plug and play, right? Like, so, you know, right now, if you want to go and access the internet, what do you do? You get a modem, you get a router, right? Like you get an IP address and you're sort of pretty much done, right? Like, but you don't have to, uh, you know, and you can build your own network however you want it behind it, right? Like you can, you know, 
have your custom protocol within your within your private network, nobody will really care about it as long as you have this sort of uh, uniform gateway that will connect you with with the rest of the internet. And so that's really the goal that we had, which is being able to come in, plug in these um, kind of gateway um, contracts or gateway accounts that we have on different ecosystems that are not chain specific, that don't have to rely on specific like consensus rules or anything like that. And then you can continue, you know, developing your your blockchain. You can continue customizing it uh, without having to have any restrictions on it. And so the goal was to really, yeah, bridge ecosystems like Cosmos, like Polkadot, with each other very frictionlessly with Bitcoin, with you know Ethereum, and and all those other um, other chains that had um, that didn't understand those protocols. Yeah. So I think maybe like from our perspective, also what's interesting, right? There is. The Axel network is a network of decentralized nodes, right? There is a role for basically node operators to operate. Of course, as Core is one, we're also kind of participating in the testnet right now. And I think maybe it would be interesting for the listeners to understand, like, what do these nodes do? And, and, and are they the ones that basically um, yeah, facilitate this interoperability? Maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that part of the, the protocol. Yeah, for sure, and uh, yeah, super excited to have you guys on the on the testnet. So uh, awesome to to see you there. Um, at the at the end of the day, you know, when when it comes to interoperability, right? Like you you have to pass information from one chain to the other, and you have to be able to validate it, and so on and so forth, right? So, Axel and Network um, at the core is an overlay of um, consensus. So it's actually based on the Tendermint consensus and the threshold cryptography that's built uh, around it. Okay, and what the validators are collectively doing is that they're executing this decentralized uh, protocol that we're building that responsible for a few things one you know understanding when a request from one of these gateway contracts uh, arrives right at a source chain understanding how to execute this request maybe doing some type of a threshold cryptography or multi-party computation protocol at the back end executing a consensus to finalize those requests, potentially deliver them to the destination chain, make sure they're executed there, and then you know, return the results back to the, um, to the source chain. So the validators in the network are running um, kind of our decentralized protocol that uh, has been built, and they're responsible for you know, managing collectively these different uh, gateway uh, accounts or gateway contracts that we deploy in different chains and uh, collectively executing sort of various read and write requests to them, right? So to read, you have to read information that arrived and you have to finalize it. So there is a certain voting that happens on the Axel network. So if you're going like from Bitcoin to Ethereum, all of the validators or some threshold of the validators, whatever the parameter is, have to say there is a request that goes from a Bitcoin to Ethereum. Let's all vote on it, you know, and finalize it and make sure, you know, we're going to be in a consistent state. Let's execute like multi-party protocol to um, kind of deliver it to the, let's say, Ethereum chain. Um, again, make sure it's finalized there, make sure it's processed. Um, and so the validators are kind of querying these different blockchains, uh, voting on the information, and then executing the Excel protocol um, underneath it to, um, to finalize on the state transitions. Okay. And I Oh, yeah. I think uh, what you just described there, um, I mean, also just reading a bit into what Axelite is, uh, you have two sort of core design principles that you use for this sort of decentralized cross-chain read-write oracle, um, as you call it. Um, maybe on a high level, you use these things called CTP queries and also this threshold bridge. I think maybe that's sort of interesting in terms of how you use that, especially compared to other protocols and you know how, how unique that is compared to what's out there already. Yeah, so um, I guess when I refer to kind of read and write cross-chain Oracle, maybe let me kind of elaborate um, a little bit there. At the end of the day, uh, if you think about actually one of the most, I think, successfully deployed uh, interoperability protocols, I, I would say today it's something like uh, Chainlink, right? Uh, because what does it allow you to do? It allows you to you know, deploy a contract and pull information from the external sources, right? And so how do you interact with it? You interact with that information by interacting with these uh, sort of contracts, right? That uh, get information from the external sources and then you as the application developer uh, can get the information in inside of your application, inside of your contract. So from that perspective, you can think of Chainlink as, as pretty much like a read oracle from external world. Right? 
now. When we talk about interoperability across blockchains, um, unfortunately, you know, reads are great, but they're not enough, right? So if you want to transfer information or transfer assets, you need a right access. <laughs> So how do you get this right access? Well, that's what, uh, you know, underneath it, the, the threshold uh, kind of cryptography empowers you to have, right? So it's a, the collection of validators are um, effectively agreeing of what right requests are authorized based on the read request that they have uh, read previously. And then they're executing um, those uh, commands. And in terms of deployment, that's why, you know, it's a similar model to how you would think about deploying uh, and integrate in with Chainlink, at least you know down the line that we're that we're working with, where you build your uh, contracts on any of the platform, and then you get to interact with this Acceler um, gateway contracts to perform read and write requests uh, to the external ecosystems, right? And the final goal that we want to get to is to allow developers to interact with these uh, cross-chain uh, commands as simply as you would interact with like ERC twenty tokens on your native chain. Right, so there's a simple interface you're familiar with as a developer. You can transfer things, you know, you can take them as collateral and so on and so forth. There's like various APIs that are exposed, and we're trying to expose like through our um, application level protocol similar types of uh, APIs for um, for the developers. Right, I think yeah. One one thing that's kind of interesting to me, I guess, is a little bit, let's say, with these bridges, you also always have kind of some, some security guarantees, right? Like, how can I trust that these assets have been actually moved across chain? And in this sense, right, the XR network and its validators, I'm assuming there is XLR staking token that um, basically uh, determines the validators. Maybe you can talk a little bit about are these validators then, all of them have to run like all the nodes on, on these different chains or uh, yeah, how, how does all that uh, kind of work together and maybe, yeah, what, what are the plans for, for that going forward? Where are there some limitations you can see also where maybe yeah, some things don't work? Maybe you, you can only do a multi-party computation with a few uh, signers or something. Is, is there something like that? Yeah, so great questions. I think, you know, you have uh, it's a a lot of questions <laughs> in, the, in one question. So let me try to, I guess, uh, unpack some of it, at least uh, the way I see it. Uh, so I think on the security model, you know, you're right, right? So there is a, um, a governance model that you can think of as similar to like a Cosmos governance model where we have a, a, a token that uh, is used to elect a, a set of validators, right? And the set of validators are um, collectively responsible for running the protocol and executing this uh, kind of cross-chain queries, right? So um, in terms of um, how many nodes like a validator would need to run, we're actually kind of internally going through the parameters and trying to think through this and you know, would love okay, your feedback guys on this. I'm sure you have a lot of kind of good thoughts around that. The goal is to uh, allow the network to scale, you know, to support as many connections as possible for some chains, you need more validators to run those nodes to be able to safely finalize the block than others, right? Uh, so some chains have, you know, efficient light clients. Some chains have, um, you know, instant finality. Some chains have probabilistic finality. So, um, but I don't think we'll be kind of a telling every, every validator to run every node. I think what we want to get to is the right thresholds within our system and say, okay, to process a chain for uh, a request from chain A to chain B, you know, you need a certain threshold of the validators to approve those events on that chain. But underneath it, the kind of the threshold protocol is still shared across all of the validators, right? So that's where, um, you know, we run our protocol and we make sure that's as efficient as possible and we can scale it to as many validators as we can. But the requests themselves, I don't think will have to uh, be finalized by every single validator. So we'll just uh, work in towards like the right thresholds for the, for the right chains and, uh, uh, and uh, work towards that. Um, and I think um, you, you had another question is like um, kind of how scalable, I guess, those threshold protocols, right, I think. Uh, and uh, so th there are uh, pretty complicated protocols today. It depends on the underlying, uh, you know, threshold scheme that you want to use. Right? So if, you, if you're working with things like ECDSA, which is, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, standards today, the underlying protocols, uh, you know, they're pretty complicated. Um, but, um, you know, we are scaling them, I think quite well. And, uh, I, I certainly think we should be able to, to get to somewhere like around a hundred, uh, validators being able to share, um, the keys collectively for, and 
The other protocols that are even more efficient uh, for, for uh, these use cases are also coming uh, you know, along. So I, uh, Schnorr, for instance, if you look at the threshold version of Schnorr, is actually quite a lot more efficient and there are fewer steps in the protocols uh, you can do. And uh, I think Bitcoin announced that they're going to be like integrating you know, uh, support for Schnorr at some point. Um, newer platforms today are also integrating BLS protocols, and um, you know, I worked on some of the standardization around there with a bunch of folks. So I'm pretty excited when that hits, uh, you know, some of the platforms as well. That's even more efficient. You can have completely sort of non-interactive way to uh, kind of co-sign on on, on messages. Um, so overall, I think the protocols today are scalable. I think you have to do the right kind of engineering work and the right optimizations. You you can do batching, you can do pre-process, and you can do all kinds of things to to really optimize them. Uh, you know, a similar way as you would optimize consensus. Uh, I think uh, you know when we started the space uh, five or seven years ago, people didn't really think you can scale consensus, and I think this is you know, one of the things we're going to try to prove wrong. But I do think you know we can scale threshold to 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 to, to support a good decentralized network. And I think you mentioned a lot of uh, cryptographic primitives for sure that you're using with Ax Axelar. And in general, you know, with your cryptographic background and also Algorand, which is very heavy on cryptography um, with Silvio, as you mentioned. Um, so I guess one thing for me that could be interesting on Axelar is, I don't know if there's a privacy focus yet, for example, with zero knowledge proofs, or if, you know, with your background, if, if you could be working on that in the future, is there any sort of synergy with, with that sort of cryptography tech in Axelar? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And we actually thought about it, I think, originally when we started the Excel network. So underneath it, because we do share, you know, a, a key across a set of validators, so we can do quite, quite a lot of interesting things. So you can do, um, you know, threshold commute, uh, commit and reveal schemes, right? If, if you want to protect against like front run and uh, protection. So some, some, some people have asked this, like, if I go from chain A to chain B, I want to make sure, you know, my requests are processed, you know, fairly in that process. So you can you can use the uh, the threshold key that's shared across the validators to do uh, kind of commit and reveal uh, protocols underneath it. Um, you know, you can think about doing um, kind of front running or uh, MEV protection, like as a service potentially. Like you can do all those things. Um, you know. I don't know what you know the future exactly would look like. I think for now we'll keep our hands full, <laughs> actually building the the core protocol, the infrastructure, and the, the protocol itself is complicated <laughs> enough that I think it'll kind of keep us busy for some time, and we'll see how it goes from yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And I mean, yeah, maybe that's a good point to touch upon. Like, I guess we we talk now about like abstractly almost about all these networks, but of course, Axlar is focusing on certain connections at the start. Maybe you can kind of go into like what are the initial networks you are. Like building the support for uh, and kind of like what use cases are you excited about there or why did you cho chose these networks in specific yeah so i guess uh, you know some of the publicly at least announced uh, uh projects that we're working with are um of course uh you know uh bitcoin i think ethereum right like uh, cosmos we're pretty close with because uh, we are based on the cosmos uh, you know sdk and uh kind of support ibc in our protocol as well we're working with um, Avalanche, we're working with uh, Terra, we're working with uh, like Moonbeam and uh, some of the Polkadot um, ecosystems as well. So, um, and kind of a bunch of others I think are in the pipeline. For us, you know, how did we choose at least some of these initial projects? We look at uh, A, um, interesting networks with interesting assets and applications that are being created. Um, B, we of course have um, you know a technical optimization problem that we you know trying to solve for is to make sure we can have as much of coverage you know as quickly as possible through the networking stack given our you know initial uh, go to market uh, support for uh, various chains. So um, effectively, what we ended up choosing at least as of now are chains that are EVM compatible. So the currently the the stack that we support allows you to kind of deploy contracts on an arbitrary EVM chain, and then assuming you have enough validators that can vote on an event from that chain, we can, you know, transfer uh, assets in and out of it. Um, so that's one. And two, uh, we recently also upgraded our SDK to, uh, you know, the latest um, Cosmos SDK, so we can interoperate within the kind of Cosmos ecosystem assets and also transfer those assets to other ecosystems, right? So 
uh, and be able to give them liquidity off uh, some of the other EVM chains that are that are out there. And the way I could see Axelar in general, and I might be completely wrong here, but it's almost like if I was a developer, I could use Axelar as my go-to sort of network uh, to see almost where the liquidity is across all these chains or what, I mean, or it's almost like Axelar could show me what the best chain would be for me to deploy my app or DAP, let's say, without needing to do the research myself. Could you see in the future, you know, future developers using Axelar you know, they see this chain has X liquidity, this chain has Y liquidity, and then maybe there's a front end that you have, for example, that shows how they're interconnecting through your network or, or some sort of service like that. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's actually a great point, right? Where uh, once you enable these types of cross-chain networks, you have um, kind of an extra array of applications that can be built, right? And I think some of them are, of course, around... Uh, uh, you know, data availability itself, right? So you understand, you know, um, basic patterns on the network. You understand like who goes from which network to to which other network. You can you can try to do some type of like analytics or predictions where, okay, I see some liquidity goes from chain A to chain B. Maybe there's like an exciting application that's about to launch on this chain, right, or something like that. Um, so I can certainly you know see a lot of the um, a lot of interesting use cases uh, kind of opening up there. Um, yeah, so I think it's a it's a great point. I think once we have the infrastructure to bridge these different ecosystems and different platforms, I think you can imagine a next uh, you know array of applications being built um, you know around them. All right. I, I had one other question. kind of, kind of on like now you are building out the support for these uh, few networks. Uh, is there some plan to like, or is it even possible for others to build support for their chain? Let's say I'm I'm a network. I want to be connected to the XLR. I work, how would I go about this? Are there like, is there a foundation? Can you get grants for this? Um, how does that all work? Or is that still like making? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great question. So yeah, at the end of the day, kind of a, we want to uh, allow anybody to build and uh, plug in their chain, right? And I think the process will be effectively the following. Like you understand what this gateway contracts look like, right? Like you want to make sure that those can be you know, port it to your blockchain. And if you have EVM compatibility, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Like maybe you have to kind of a tweak here and there, but other than that, there's, you know, not much. And we, we wrote also like at least initial contracts for uh, Cosmosm. So if you have support for that, you can kind of deploy it on, on your chain, you probably write those contracts in a few other different uh, languages uh, for different blockchain stacks. Um, but they're pretty simple. They're just like deploying tokens and, uh, you know, uh, burning and minting and uh, things like that, at least uh, right now. Um, and then from there, well, uh, after the network is live, you'll have to make sure that once the contracts are deployed, then the enough of the actual validators can, again, like vote on the events of, uh, from that chain, right? So maybe there is a kind of a governance uh, protocol that you would have to uh, kind of a pass through this uh, integration and assuming, you know, the users want to see that connection and validators kind of pick up the nodes and can query the RPC endpoints, then, um, you know, then you, we can, we can support the, the integration with it. And this is where I think one of the kind of a big advantages of having a, a network as opposed to kind of a, uh, one of the one off uh, bridging technologies is that once you plug in a new chain, you get to interact with all the other chains that have been interconnected previously, right? So it kind of gives you one connector, gives you connectivity with n other networks that have previously like enrolled in the protocol and already been interconnected to. So you don't have to kind of roll out custom tech for every new integration. You get to benefit from this uh, composability. Yeah, that's that's definitely a very great benefit. I think you know one thing that I always found interesting is this idea in in Cosmos there exists this idea of like the interchain account basically where. A, a blockchain owns like an account on another blockchain. It feels like that's basically Axelar also, right? Like this idea of uh, the validators then having tokens. I mean, maybe um, do you imagine as a user, the end user, will I ever like leave the Axelar network with my token? Am I like sending it to an address on this other blockchain that I own myself? Or am I just like keeping my tokens in the Axelar kind of network? Or what are the trade-offs there? Or how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, so it, it, it's a great question. I think two things maybe to say there. So initially, I think for kind of the launch, we'll focus on 
um, simple interfaces that will allow users to like send their tokens in a, in a wrapped fashion approach, right? So that they can be used in the applications. And so we'll, uh, you know, work with various partners to build like various front ends on top of the Excel network to, uh, to support this. So as a user, you'll still have to kind of specify, you know, a destination address potentially on the chain that you want to go. You'll get like, a source address where you need to uh, deposit your funds and then, the Excel network will effectively uh, manage it and, and uh, collectively be responsible for it. The end goal, though, that I think as an ecosystem we have to get to is we have to abstract it away from the users, right? So at the end of the day, what do users want? Users want to be able to say, well, I have this asset, okay, and there's an application, and I want to use the application with my asset. Okay? It doesn't matter what chain they're built on. doesn't matter, like, you know... Um, Kind of a, how do I go from a chain A to a chain B? Okay, assuming there is enough you know security and you actually trust the application and trust the, the asset, you should be able to use it and interact with it uh, kind of directly. And for that, of course, you know you, you shouldn't have to go through you know an interface to go from a chain A to a chain B, from chain B to a chain C. I think and like replicate this sort of wrapped assets across the ecosystem. All of that uh, has to be uh, abstracted away from the users. And so. This is why we're building this um, kind of application level protocol that applications can interact with and so that they get to effectively give their users um, uh, almost like instantaneous access to the application with assets that may potentially come from a different ecosystem, right? So as an application, like what is a simple type of request that you would need? You'll need to say, okay, generate like a deposit address because I'm trying to create like a new pool on my DEX, generate a deposit address where my user will be able to deposit funds, right? So as an application, you can then issue this call to this uh, gateway contract. The Excel network understands what chain you want to interact with, kind of gives you a deposit address, returns it back to your application, and then you can like display it back to the user and the user can go from their wallet, you know, deposit the funds on this contract, and then the state of the application will be updated uh, kind of correctly underneath it. So, so I really think that um, while you know we will have this wrapped assets approach and things like that uh, for the launch, I think there has to be more of a direct integration from the application that will have to come in in order to make it seamless for the users to interact with multiple ecosystems. Today, the experience you know is brutal. Besides, uh, <laughs> uh, besides all the kind of other shortcomings, I think that uh, as a user you have to go through. And maybe. Uh, another question I might have would be, you know, with some of these bridges, et cetera, and user experience that we have today, there are quite often wait periods, et cetera, that you just have to put up with. And like you said, with fragmented liquidity and wrapped assets, et cetera. So as a user, would I have to wait any period of time to, like you said, use some application with an asset on one chain? Is there some time there that I have to wait before the other application receives, you know, my transaction or is, is that going to be instantaneous? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you go in uh, from chain A to chain B, you always have to think about, you know, finality rules on a chain A and chain B and things like that. I do think that once this kind of robust infrastructure is in place, we're going to see a new set of uh, players evolve that will effectively be like market makers that will sit, you know, between the front end of the application and back end network, right? And so what they'll do is they'll probably keep like pools of assets uh, on the different chains and they intersect, you know, the request on the front end, maybe take some risk that those requests will not be finalized or not processed, but also take a cut in the middle uh, for allowing the user to kind of transfer the assets instantaneously, right? So maybe I, I see a transaction, I validate it, do some local checks. I, I'm really confident that it's going to go through. I'm going to take a percent, uh, you know, cut for this request, and then I'm going to settle with the Excel network or whatever bridge and tech I use underneath it to, uh, you know, to, to finalize it and I, I take some, some cut in the middle. So, so I do think we're going to get to, um, you know, a position where uh, the users will see pretty much uh, kind of instant confirmation uh, for themselves uh, because I do think there is uh, enough of demand from the folks to absorb the risks uh, of these networks. Yeah, that sounds like a good, great vision. And I think, yeah, that's, that might well happen. And then the end goal of like the user, like, I guess you're right now at this point, it's still the infrastructure phase in blockchain. It seems to be always, <laughs> maybe at some yeah, point we yeah. can get like, uh, make it also possible for user. I mean, um, yeah, we can already see, I guess w some applications have become smoother over time. Of course, once we go cross chain, you bring back some of the complexity that initially was kind of not there on Ethereum uh, alone. 
but yeah, uh, sounds like there's at least some credible path to go there. Um, maybe to like slowly wrap up, um, we talked a little bit about yeah how the network works. We also mentioned initially the the test net, right? Uh, can you and then also I guess recently you just closed a fundraising round, so yeah, congrats on that. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, yeah how that has been going, where you are at right now in terms of like timeline, roadmap, um, and things like that. Yeah, so uh, we're currently, you know, on the testnet environment uh, with various folks, uh, you know, participating and uh, completing like various exercises on the network, um, signing up, uh, spinning up like validators, building like simple dashboards, uh, wallet integrations, and so on and so forth. And so the goal is over the next uh, you know, few months is to iterate through the test networks, right? So we are getting close to, uh, you know, at least a, an MVP feature complete, like, uh, you know, on our on our end, and we want to make sure that the network is, uh, you know, as robust as scalable uh, and um, as, uh, you know, as secure as possible. Because it is a new infrastructure stack, there is, of course, this educational component that we have to make sure that, you know, all the ecosystem um, players that we uh, want to engage with, like, you know, validators, like folks that are building like, monitor tools and so on and so forth, um, you know, they understand the stack, they know how to work with it, they know how to interact with it, they can you know, set up the right uh, tools uh, for themselves. And so we're going to be doing that a component uh, on the kind of community side and uh, uh, letting people more and more get engaged with the um, with the network. We this week already actually started an audit of our um, threshold library. So that's going to continue for some weeks and we're probably going to uh, kind of continue uh, auditing the rest of the code base from there. Um, and yeah, so the funding that we took, uh, you know, is uh, really to allow us to accelerate the, the roadmap a little bit and scale and support more integrations initially and uh, start building this uh, ecosystem around the Axel network, right? So it's not just, a, you know, a technology. I think at the end of the day, as an ecosystem, if we embrace the cross-chain and the multi-chain world, there's all kinds of infrastructure that needs to be built, right? There's It's, it's a huge opportunity and it's, an, it's a huge, uh, you know, technical and usability challenge. And uh, I think all of those things, um, I think uh, we as an industry will have to kind of come together and solve it. And so, you know, we certainly want to uh, help in, on those fronts as well. Great, yeah, very well said. Thanks, Sergey. And um, yeah, I think from both Felix and myself, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been fantastic to talk to you. And I think Axelar itself is such a unique network. And um, I mean, I think so many people are looking forward to it going live very soon and so you know great to get some insights from you into the sort of intricacies of axelar perhaps before we wrap up um if you want to just leave perhaps your own social media also axelars or where people can find you yeah for sure uh so if you go to uh, axelar.network uh, which is our um you know website you'll find sources to the uh, white paper to uh various um, sign-up forms for the testnet, for instance, if you want to participate, you'll be able to find, um, you know, various blogs and uh, kind of information about, uh, you know, the team and some of the partners that we're working with. Uh, so, uh, yep, sign up, uh, you know, uh, on Discord, on Telegram. I think there's various ways to get involved and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing everybody join. Thank you, Sergey, for joining. And yeah, have a nice day. Thanks, Sergey. Thanks, guys. It was awesome. Thanks for having me.